you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for your grace that abounds. I thank you that today we can be thankful. And Father, I just pray that our hearts be open to receive what you have for us tonight. And uh, Lord, that we would leave this place encouraged yet challenged as we go out of these four walls in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, you know, uh, I was thinking about this, and uh, I've entitled this Lord of the Harvest. I was thinking of a Thanksgiving Day message, right? And I, I was going to come at it from the backside or backwards. I was going to come at it from being unthankful, right? I don't know about you, but when I do math or when I have problems with some complicated math, if I start from the back or from the answer and I work my way front to the front, I can figure out the formula. Right? And so I was going to come from the back side and think about unthankfulness. And as I started to write down, I started at my computer and I started typing everything out. All of a sudden, it, it, it just grew and grew and grew. And uh, uh, so I'm not even really speaking about that at all, <laughs> to tell you the truth. The Holy Spirit just started uh, speaking to me and I just started typing. And, and uh, how many know the Lord of the harvest is Jesus? And uh, so I, I'm going to bring some things to you a little bit differently next week. Now, uh, I know I, I, this is one of the reasons I didn't start it this week is because uh, usually on Thanksgiving Sundays, we're a little bit smaller and we were smaller in Melford as well this morning. Um, but uh, next week, I'm going to start a series on the Lord's Prayer. And uh, the Lord's Prayer, like you've never heard it before. I told you the last week to go study it in Aramaic, which is the language Jesus would have spoken. I shared with you last week how, you know, part of the prayer says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And, you know, it sounds like God doesn't forgive unless we forgive and different things. But in Aramaic, the way Jesus would have spoken, it, it says, break the chains or loose the chains that bind us so we can loose the chains or the guilt and shame that we have towards others. It's not, it's not make a big difference. Break those chains and such. And it's amazing prayer in Aramaic right from the beginning. So I don't really know how long that series is going to go, but I'm going to start it next week on the Lord's Prayer uh, from how Jesus would have spoken in, in Aramaic. And it's just going to be an exciting study. Now, if there was anything I would, uh, I'll give you the whole sum of the whole message tonight right now. It's not on the PowerPoint yet. It'll come a little bit later. But here's the whole, if, if you get, don't get anything else tonight, here's what I want you to get. You know, so many times we go to, to church and we talk about the impossible and, and uh, you know, the supernatural and different things like that. Tonight's message is this. God's only calling you to do the possible, and he does the impossible. And we're talking about God participating in life with us, but the only thing, God's never called you to do the impossible. Did you know that? We've heard messages that we're supposed to go and do the impossible. You can't, because only God can do the impossible. And he's only told you and me, he's only called you and me to do what's possible. For example, in James it says, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Guess what? You can't heal the sick, right? That's impossible for you. What is possible for you is for you to lay hands on the sick. You do the possible. God does the impossible. And so if you don't get anything else out of this message tonight, that is the whole sum and the key of the message uh, is is uh, you do the possible and God will do the impossible. So it's Thanksgiving Sunday, right? And Thanksgiving was originally celebrated as a day of giving thanks for the blessing of the harvest. And I, I, I the blessing of the harvest. I just want to go back for a second though, because the Lord's you know, putting some things in my mind about Him, you doing the possible and Him doing the impossible. Do you know in Hebrews chapter eleven? That is the chapter of faith. If you want to see the faith chapter, you go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and you look at some of the men and the women that are there, and you think about Noah. Noah did what was possible. He built an ark. He physically could do that. He went and cut the trees down. How many know God didn't cut all the trees down for Noah, right? He went and cut the trees. He went and shaped the trees. 120 years, he worked at this ark. He did what was possible, and God did what was impossible. Well, what did God do? God brought all the animals two by two. Have you ever tried to round up all the animals and bring them someplace? 
God did that. Have you ever tried to round up cats? That's impossible. Uh, I was watching Mythbusters a couple of years ago, and they're trying to round up cats. You know, you can round up horses, you can round up cattle, you can round up sheep, but you cannot round up cats. They are just impossible. But God brings them two by two into the ark. God does the impossible and saves Noah and his family. You think about Abraham. The, uh, the only thing Abraham had to do is walk. He did what was possible. And he, him and his family went for a long walk. And God did the impossible. And God brought them to the land that he showed them filled with milk and honey. And then you go down. Uh, there's Moses. Moses only did what was possible. Uh, God said to Moses when he was at the burning bush, put your hand into your bosom in, or underneath your coat. And so Moses did what was possible. He put it in his coat. He brought it out. It was full of leprosy. God says, put it back in and bring it out. And it was clean. He, God, Moses only did what was possible. God did what was impossible. God, God said, Moses, throw down your stick. And it turned into a snake. God did the impossible. He said, Moses, pick it up by the tail. So Moses did what was possible and picked up the snake by the tail. Anybody, anybody ever like picking up snakes? Anybody here pick up snakes? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I uh, chased one down this summer. I chased a garter snake down and, and, and grabbed it. And it was, I like scaring people with snakes because everybody seems to be freaked out by snakes. Anyways, uh, and he grabbed it by the tail and, and God did the impossible and made it back into a staff. God leads the children of Israel to the Red Sea. He says, Moses, I want you to do what's possible. You just spread your hand out with that rod over the sea, and God did the impossible, and he opened it up, and they walked across on dry land. You go to, uh, later on, you've got the, uh, Joshua. God says, Joshua, I want you to do what's possible. I want you to walk around Jericho. All right, and on the seventh day, I want you to walk around it seven times. How many know that was possible? And God did the impossible by knocking the, the walls down. You think about David. If David did what was possible, he just went out with a slingshot to fight this giant. But God did what was impossible and first that little guy to kill the, the giant. And you go through all the scripture and God's only called you to do what is possible and he does the impossible. This is, a, this is a true with a prophetic. God says, I want you to speak. And he says, I'll do the impossible. I'll give you the words. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do the impossible when you do the possible. And so we think about this Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is a, uh, originally started. It was a blessing for the harvest or of the harvest. Now, there's a few farmers, I have some farmer friends, that aren't very thankful right now. <laughs> uh, they don't have all their crop off, and it's out there in the wet snow, and then the snow has got to melt, and then it's got to dry up so that they can get out there. Uh, I want you to know that Paul says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Do you know that it doesn't say, for everything give thanks? It says, in everything give thanks. I was watching Facebook a video this last week, and it was Darce on Thursday. And he was out blowing sprinklers on Thursday in the snow. And uh, I was thinking about this. I'm sure Darce was not thankful for the snow and the cold wet weather. But in that, he found a way to be thankful that he could still actually go out and blow out sprinklers and go to work and all these different things. And, and so you're not supposed to be thankful for everything, but in everything, find something to be thankful for. And then it says, why? Because this is God's will. It is God's will for you to be thankful in everything, not for everything. All right? And so uh, this thankful for the harvest, and it's a time we ought to recognize that God is inviting us to participate in life with him. Where did you hear that word before? He wants us to participate in life with him. And uh, when you participate with someone, that requires a relationship, doesn't it? It requires a relationship. If I participate with you and we go out for coffee, it requires some form of relationship. And so God is calling us to a relationship with Him. How do we get that from celebrating Thanksgiving? Well, I'm glad you asked, right? That was the question that we're, how do you get that out of Thanksgiving? How do you get all this, right? So I, I want to bring this back to the harvest and planting. And uh, who planted the seeds earlier this year in the gardens? Did some of you have gardens? Who planted those seeds? Did God just make those rows and plant those seeds for you? Did, or did you do it? You did it, didn't you? In the, in the farmer's fields, they went and they planted the, 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 the seeds. 
And, and who harvested the fruit? I mean, we got some great vegetables from Joette, uh, and we didn't have to harvest it. I think God sent an angel to harvest it for us. And that angel was Joanne, wasn't it? Oh, it was Corey. <laughs> It's still an angel, all right? So, uh, but you guys had to go out into your garden and pick it. Those carrots just didn't come out of the ground themselves, didn't they? Now, I know you wish they did, and the potatoes, you wish they would have just cleaned themselves off, and, but they didn't come out themselves. You planted, you uh, harvested, but let me ask you this. Who made those seeds grow? <laughs> you, you see, you did what was possible. You took those seeds and you put them in rows and you planted them and you harvested them, which is possible. But God did what was impossible and that was make those seeds grow. He's the one that provided the soil. He provided the rain. He provided the sunshine. He provided all those things in the first place. And in my opinion, okay, I'm going to give you my opinion here. There is a subculture in Christianity all right, a subculture. It's not everywhere. It's a subculture in Christianity that expects God to do everything for them. And they sit back and just expect God to give them everything. Then it's like, and you know, they phone up the pastor and say, uh, Pastor, will you agree with me that God will give me X amount of money so that I can go buy this? And I'm like, wait a minute. I don't know if it works that way, right? Uh, God's inviting us to participate with Him, but there's a subculture in Christianity that says, okay, God's done everything for me. Uh, I, I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to receive everything from Him. Uh, and really, God's inviting us to participate with Him. From the beginning, that was never God's intention. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says, And the Lord took the man, and He put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it, and keep it. My my PowerPoint person's in there. Well, I, okay, I already put her to sleep. <laughs> Genesis 2.15, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Guess what? That was before the fall. God put man in the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. You see, God had provide, already provided everything man needed, but God knew that man had to have something to do. Now, of course, after the fall, the working conditions changed, didn't they? Now, I would like to work before the fall, not after. Of course, the work, excuse me, the working conditions changed in that now there's thistles. Now there's weeds. How many of you gardeners went out weeding and said, thank the Lord for weeds? Nobody, right? The working conditions changed. And uh, 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 it changed from perfect soil to soil that has to be tilled. It went from no weeds to uh, the nuisance of weeds and thistles. They went from perfect growing conditions like a greenhouse to not so perfect uh, growing conditions. So the working uh, conditions have changed. But even before the fall of man, God knew that man had something to do. Why, why would you do that? Well, because you don't create something without a purpose. God didn't create you without a purpose. I was thinking about this tonight, and uh, Wes, he, he built a deck this summer. Uh, I actually haven't seen it yet. I guess i got to get out there and see it before you work on mine, see if it passes inspection or whatever. It's all under snow right now. It's all under snow right now. But how many know that Wes didn't create a, 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 a deck for no purpose? It's got a purpose. You want to go out that door. You want to barbecue on it. You want to sit on it. You, you've got a purpose. And the same is true with God. God did not create man without giving us a purpose. Because without a purpose, the creation becomes useless. If there is no purpose for the deck, it's useless. And if it's useless, then it has no value. And so if God didn't have a purpose for mankind, then we would be useless and we would have no value. But that's not what God did. He created man. He gave us a purpose. He created you with a purpose. And if you're still alive here tonight, which all of you are, then you still have a purpose. God's got a purpose for you. And if you've got a purpose, then you're useful. And if you've got a purpose, then you also have value. You're valuable. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're valuable. Right? You're valuable. And, and, and it's bigger than that, though. You see, God loves what he created. Every time he created something, he turned around and he said, and God says, it was good. Which means it was perfect. God did it. He said, it is good. And he loves what he created. 
And God loves you. And he invites you to participate in life with him. Did you hear that? God loves you and he's inviting you to participate in life with him. Because God didn't create man just to look after a garden. God created man to reveal his immense love. God loved so much that he created us. Even knowing what we were going to do, he still created us. And he, so that he could just love us. He also created us. Think about it this for a second, all right? Sometimes we think we're supposed to be robots. But God created us to think intricate thoughts. To think for ourselves. Did you think about that? God created you with a brain to think for yourself. To have problems and find solutions. Now, I know that uh, some things, like we, we, we sit around and I uh, saw a Facebook message, uh, post the other day. And it was Scrabble. <laughs> There's some people that really like Scrabble. You know, or, or uh, I like crossword puzzles. Uh, I forget what they're uh, called right now, the numbers things. What are those called? What's that? Sudoku. Sudoku. I like Sudoku. You know, our brains are wired to try and find solutions to problems. And I was thinking about this. God said to Adam and Eve, you cultivate the garden. And I don't have evidence, no biblical evidence, but I bet you God said, didn't, didn't tell them how to do it. They had to figure it out themselves. He gave them a mind to figure out some solutions that you have to trim this way and if you cut the hedges this way it's better and if you do all these different things and, you know so he created us to be able to uh, uh find solutions and we all enjoy that yeah uh, we all enjoy doing things that have you have to find a solution for otherwise lives would be our lives would be just plain boring if you had absolutely nothing to do your life would be boring so even in the garden adam and eve were given a task to cultivate and keep the Garden of Eden, to keep them and their minds busy, to have fellowship with God. God created us with the ability to work and be successful in everything we do because God knew. Now, I know you're thinking, this is a grace church. We don't talk about work and effort here. Well, we are tonight, all right? Because God knew this. Idle minds and idle hands lead to destruction. Here's a, uh, let's see, uh, an idle brain is the devil's workshop. I thought it was in the Bible, but it's not there, all right? Uh, it, it, one who has nothing to do will be tempted to do many mischievous acts. How many know that's true? I was uh, with my brother-in-law yesterday, and, and he was telling us how his eight-year-old, he was at work, and his mom wasn't home from work, and their eight-year-old got their friends together, and they decided to get into the cupboards, uh, they had nothing to do, and they got into the flour, they got into the food coloring, and there was a mess. And then they decided to, you know, take their uh, fruit and dip it into peanut butter. Sounds good, but you only need this much peanut butter, and they had this much peanut butter to dip a couple pieces of fruit into, and then they took honey into the peanut butter and swirled it up just to make sure that they would have a good consistency for their fruit. So they had uh, leftover fruit, they had uh, peanut butter and honey, they had flour, they had dye, it was everywhere. How many know that if you leave your kids alone, bad things are gonna happen, right, when they're young? Have you experienced that? Maybe some of you haven't. I have, all right? So uh, we know that if you don't have anything to do, uh, you'll be tempted to do many mischievous acts. Now, I want to see what, look, show you what the scripture says about this. In Proverbs uh, chapter 18, verse 9, it says, He also who is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. It's talking about being lazy. If you're slack in your work, is a brother to him who destroys. A few years ago when I was in politics, I did some in-depth research on crime, all right? A universal, universal statistics on crime and different things. And you know what I found was universal common denominator of crime? And Bruce is here, he can verify this. This is the universal common denominator of crime is poverty. The higher poverty rate you have, the higher the crime rate you have, why do you think God doesn't want you to live in poverty? Or want us to live in poverty? And so it doesn't matter where you go. If you go to the streets of New York or you go to the streets of Saskatoon or uh, you go over to Germany or wherever you go, the higher the poverty rate, the higher the crime rate. And I want to be careful in not to use the word all, but when it comes down to the people who cause destruction of property, 
vandalism, no respect for others' property, spray painting buildings and fences, breaking into buildings, etc. Most of these things are the result of people who have been affected by poverty. You know, just in Saskatoon on Friday, there was a, a man shot by the police, and uh, I, I went on his Facebook page after his name was released, uh, and I found who this was, and I found out that his girlfriend had lived in Saskatoon. Actually, his girlfriend is a friend on Facebook with a pastor friend of mine. And uh, what I found out about this young man that came out afterwards, is uh, even through his Facebook page, was that he used to work on the rigs. All right? He worked on the rigs. He's laid off because of the downturn of the oil. And, and he's in Saskatoon. And he's got a drug problem. How many know that most addicts also have a poverty problem? Right? That's, that's, it's, uh, they spend all their money on drugs. And so even on Friday, this young man, whose life was still ahead of him, cut short. Really, it was somebody that was affected by poverty. All right? So the higher the poverty rate, the higher the crime rate. So part of the solution is go to work. Get a job. Even if it's a meaningless job like working at McDonald's, right? Work at McDonald's, you get a job, you keep a job. And that's part of the solution to uh, solving our crime is for people to actually get to work. And God will bless everything you put your hand to and cause you to be a success. And so uh, I, I, that was just for free. But I just want you to know that, that uh, uh, those uh, who destroy, that's one of the reasons God wants you to be successful. God wants you to be prosperous because poverty and crime are linked hand in hand. Now, Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4 says, He who deals with a lazy hand becomes poor. But the hand of the hard worker makes rich. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. I've got some farmer friends, and possibly you've got some farmer friends. And if they got up every morning and said, Oh my, uh, it looks like it's going to rain today. I better stay here. No, they get out there and do as much as they can, knowing that the rain, those clouds, doesn't mean, don't mean rain. It may pass over and they may not get anything. And so they get out. If they look at the clouds, they'll never get it. If they look at the clouds for harvesting, they'll just never get it done. The, the, the uh, Ecclesiastes says, if the farmer looks at the clouds, he just won't do it. So he just goes and he does it. In Proverbs chapter 21, verses 5 to 26, it says, The desire of the sluggard puts him to death, for his hands refuse to work. All day long he is craving, while the righteous gives and does not hold back. People who are slackers, or uh, in this, it's a polite way of saying lazy. People who are lazy are takers, all right? Here's some practical in with the spiritual. Uh, people who are lazy are takers. They take from the government. They feel they're entitled to more, all right? They will try and take from you, and they will try and take from God. People who are slackers, they're takers. But righteous people, turn to somebody and say, I'm righteous. That's who you are. You're righteous. All right? It says they give and they're givers and they don't hold back. There's a big difference between the two, isn't there? Givers are the righteous people. They have, you can't give unless you have something to give. And uh, lazy people or slackers, they're takers. Now, some of you might be saying, well, Kevin, that's the old covenant. Uh, I want to take you to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11, where Paul is admonishing the believers in Thessalonica. And here it says this. It says, For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but are acting as busybodies. <laughs> That's what Paul says to the church, the people that were at Thessalonica. Uh, and you know what a busybody is, right? In Greek, this word busybody is those who work all around the work but get nothing done. Have you ever seen that? You know, you have a church cleaning and there's people going, there's people who are looking busy, but they actually aren't doing anything, right? Uh, I, I, I had to admit this morning that it, there's been times in my life where I've been a busybody. You know, I, I didn't share this this morning, I'll share with you tonight, but uh, when my mom told me to clean my room, I was a busybody. I would look busy and I didn't do a thing. 
<laughs> right? I was in there and I'd move this to here and here to there and here to there. And she'd come in an hour later and say, Kevin, this room still hasn't, it doesn't, isn't clean. And, but you know, I looked busy. I was a busy body. I didn't want to do it. Right? And so it's those who bustle around. They have lots of energy going around and accomplishing nothing. <laughs> That's a busybody. And, and Paul is saying that you're acting like busybodies. You're not doing any work. You're not accomplishing anything. But that's not how God created us to function. He created us to work together with Him. In the natural, God's design is that we would plant fields, that we would harvest the fields, and that He would do the impossible. He would do the rest. He would cause that seed to grow, and he would, it would produce. God doesn't do everything, but He does what we cannot do. God does the impossible. And we don't do everything, but we do what we can do, leaving God to do the impossible. Amen? You do what you can do, God does what it's a partnership together. And then uh, God does the impossible, we do the, impo uh, sorry, we do the possible. We plant, we harvest, but it is God who makes that seed grow and produce. It's so simple, yet we've somehow made it so difficult. And I know this is a strange Thanksgiving message. But I want to remind us, uh, as, we, as I was a couple of weeks ago uh, in Melbourne, we had a special speaker for our 80th celebra uh, uh, celebration. And he reminded us a couple of weeks ago that there's another type of harvest. There's a harvest of souls. There's people that need Jesus. And they're out there in Saskatoon and Newinlog and Hepburn and Warman and Roster, wherever you live tonight, there are people there that are ready to be harvested for the kingdom of God. And he took us to John chapter 4. It was the story of the Samaritan woman where uh, she's at the well and Jesus is at the well and he begins to talk to her. And she goes and tells uh, all the community what Jesus had done. And they start coming out. And as they're coming out, the disciples come back. They were gone and they come back up to read it in John chapter 4. And in verse 35, Jesus says to his disciples, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. He, he sees this crowd of people coming out of the city. And he's telling his disciples, look out. They're ready for harvest. In verse 37, he says, one sows and another reaps. In verse 38 he says, I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. I was thinking about that. And, you know, I was thinking about Jerry Lynn. Jerry Lynn found us, but she didn't find us because of me or you. She found us because of somebody in Alfred. A mutual friend in Alfred sent her to church. And guess what? She went to the wrong church the first time. <laughs> And then she got back and she came to the right church and, and uh, found us. And, and uh, uh, you know, somebody labored and we get the pleasure of reaping Jerry Lynn for the kingdom of God. And it's awesome. It's awesome. It's, uh, and, and, and her story is amazing. And I want you to go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, 38. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, Apollos, I planted Apollos water, but God gives the increase. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38, we have Jesus here. It says this, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. That should tell us something right now. Do you know all over the place where you live, people are distressed and they're dispirited like a sheep without a shepherd? They're looking for something. And then in verse 37, he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers to his harvest. And Jesus, in this passage, he's going through the cities. He's proclaiming the gospel. He's healing every kind of disease. He's healing every kind of sickness. And what's happening? People are beginning to follow him everywhere he goes. And he has compassion on them. And at that point, 
when they're following him and they see them without, like a like sheep without a shepherd, he says this, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. For this reason, pray the Lord of the harvest will send out workers to the harvest. Who's the Lord of the harvest? It's God, isn't it? It's Jesus. He's the Lord of the harvest. And I want you to know that there's not one prayer that Jesus prayed that wasn't answered. And I want you to know tonight that you are actually the answer to Jesus' prayer. You are the worker that Jesus prayed for to go out into the harvest. Did you know that? You are it. You're it. You and I are workers being sent out to gather a harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. That was the answer to Jesus' prayer. You're it. Now, I know sometimes we, we uh, uh, talk about how to, right? How do I lead somebody to the Lord? How do I talk to people about the Lord? How do I do this? I, I want to come at it from the, the back end tonight. And I'm going to give you five excuses that stop us from bringing in God's harvest. All right? Here they are. Five excuses that stop us from bringing in God's harvest. Number one is... Uh, just hit it again. Every one of these, we'll have to do it a second time. Uh, number one is, we just haven't noticed. It's, did you hit it again? Oh, boy. All right. Well, uh, hit the forward button. Maybe I, uh, it doesn't matter. We haven't noticed. In John chapter uh, 4, he tells his disciples, Jesus tells his disciples, lift up your eyes. Do you know what? They were hungry. They were looking for food at that time. And Jesus says, I've got food that you don't even know about. And, and Jesus says, lift up your eyes. They were so concerned about themselves that they didn't even notice the people that were coming. Do you know that in, sometimes in churches, we get so concerned about ourselves. How many people were at church tonight? How much money came in? How did we do this? And we get so concerned about ourselves that we never notice those outside the four walls that are waiting to come into a service. I was reprimanded a couple of weeks ago. Uh, somebody, uh, I said to somebody, well, I haven't seen you at church. This is somebody who hasn't been here yet. And they said to me, you never invited me. I was shocked because in my opinion, if you're a Christian particularly, why do you need an invitation to come to church? You just go. So it, it got, it, it had to change my mind. Sometimes people just need an invitation. If you just invite and say, hey, yeah, and it's the same thing with, with Jesus. Would you like Jesus in your life? We just haven't noticed. We haven't lifted up our heads. We get so busy bustling around doing things that don't have any eternal benefit. And in doing so, we don't even notice those who are ready and calling out for someone to bring them to Jesus. Number two is we convinced ourselves that others don't want to hear about Jesus. We've convinced ourselves, I'm sorry, I guess that's just not going to come up, but we've convinced ourselves that others don't want to hear about Jesus. You know, we don't want to offend people with the gospel. You know, so we don't even plant seeds, you know. It's, we kind of hide it, right? And Paul says, how will they hear without a preacher? And we've convinced ourselves that others don't want to hear about Jesus. The truth is, people are tired of hearing about religion. But people are hungry for Jesus. I have a book. It says, they hate the church, but they love Jesus. That's the title of the book. They hate the church, but they love Jesus. Because people don't want religion. And the problem is, is that we connect Jesus with religion. And I want you to know tonight that Jesus is not a religion. Jesus is a person that walked on this earth. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus loves you and loves me. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. Who took away, he took away our sin. And he invites us to participate in life with him. Jesus is not a religion. But we, we connect Jesus with religion, and so people don't want religion, so we don't talk to them about Jesus. But there's a difference. 
Jesus is not a religion. It was Gandhi that said, I like your Jesus, but I don't like the religion. It was <laughs> quite the statement. Number three, we're scared. We're scared of rejection. You know, uh, you don't know this about me yet, but you're going to tonight. I hate rejection. You would never know this about me, but I could never ask out a girl when I was single unless I knew she was going to say yes first. I would have little spies go find out if she would ask, if she would say yes before I ever asked her out. Because I can't stand any rejection. I, I'm scared. I'm terrified of rejection. Before I ever asked Marianne out, I was the youth pastor. I had this youth become her friend, and she came back and told me, you know, Kevin, if you ask her out, she won't say no. <laughs> I had to have that assurance before I even asked her on a date. And so we're scared. We're scared of rejection. We're scared of being scoffed at. We're scared of being made, a fun, uh, made fun of. We're scared of offending others. But fear doesn't come from God, does it? <laughs> Fear is the enemy's tactic of manipulation. If he can cause you to be afraid, you'll never reap the harvest. And we overcome fear with love, 1 John 4, 18. When we love others as God loves them, all fear loves because 1 John 4, 18 says, perfect love casts out fear. And so we don't have to fear anymore. But so I, I, I'm admitting that's, that's been my part problem in the past. Is I'm scared. You know, I don't think that's I'm scared, fear. Number four, you may have felt this at some time. We feel unskilled. We're not qualified. We're inadequate. We're incapable of sharing the gospel. Well, I don't know as much about the, the, the gospel as the pastor. I need to bring this person to the pastor so that they can talk to them about the gospel. Do you know what? We're not called to be skilled to share the Bible with great knowledge. Let me share that with you right now. You're not called to share, to be skilled in sharing Christ in your great knowledge. We're called to share Christ through great love. We're called to have faith that the Holy Spirit in those very moments will give us words to say. That we trust Him and, and give us wisdom. And the truth is, you're not called to share everything that Jesus has done for the world. You just start sharing what Jesus has done for you. And when we've got our mind turned around, that I, I don't have to be really skilled in all the Bible and all the verses to convince people. All I got to do is be skilled at what God is doing in my life or what he's done for me. And do you know who is the most qualified person to share your story as you're participating with Christ? It's you. I'm not the best person to share your story. It's your story with Jesus. And so, with, you know, all of a sudden that excuse is gone that I'm not skilled, I'm not qualified. Yes, you are. Because Jesus lives in you. He's participating in life with you. All you have to do is share your story. And you're the most qualified to share your story. The last one is this. Well, somebody else will do it. We don't want to make the effort. We're comfortable. And this might be more work. In fact, in churches we have this. I'll cheer you on. You go. I'll even support you financially. You know, uh, uh, as you go and win the world to the Lord, to, to, to the Jesus and the missionaries, you go and we'll support you financially because it eases my conscience when I know that I'm supporting somebody else to do the work. So you go do the work. I want you to know tonight that when we use these excuses, we miss out on the most amazing experience. And if you've ever experienced it, you can verify this with me. The most incredible feeling you will ever have in your life is when you sit down one-on-one -on -one with somebody and you lead them to Jesus. When you lead them to Jesus, there is, ah, I can't even describe that incredible feeling that comes over me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's, when you have that experience, it is better Peers, all of you, than watching the Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup. 
I would rather lead somebody to Jesus than watch Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals with the Toronto Maple Leafs. It is better than going to uh, uh, Mosaic Field or the new field that they're going to have next uh, year for them and watch the Rough Riders win a game. As exciting as that is, and I've done, well, sorry, I've never watched the Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup. They won before I was born the last time. Somebody posted on my timeline, uh, when the strong Maple Leafs stood up, uh, won the cup, it was black and white photos. <laughs> it's more exciting and, than, than being there at a game. It's, it's, more, it's the most incredible feeling you will ever have in your life. I remember being out in Ontario and we led a whole bunch of drug addicts to the Lord. And they were coming in. We, they had this place where teens hung out. And they started coming in. I remember, I remember talking to this one guy in particular and he's like, Kevin, I led my friends to Jesus today. This guy, I was walking with him in the hallways of his high school. It was the first time I ever seen cocaine as he pulled it out of his pocket. And he said, Kevin, this is better than the highest high I've ever had when he started leading his friends to Jesus. You know why I'm sharing this? Because I don't want you to miss out. That God's calling you and he's calling me. There's this great calling on your life and on my life to be fellow workers with him. In fact, that's exactly the term Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, that we are fellow workers with Christ. And God's not asking you to do the impossible. He's only asking you to do what's possible. And He does what's impossible. Let me close with this. God is calling you to be a planter. I love in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God causes growth. They're talking about Apollos and Paul. He's like, you know what? Everywhere I go, I'm just spreading seeds. It's all you and I are. We're planters. We water seeds that have already been planted, and then we reap harvest. Do you know what's going to happen? You may be planting seeds and planting seeds and planting seeds, and 20 years down the road, you get a phone call from this person that's planted the seeds, and they're like, guess what? I gave my heart to Jesus. And you're like, well, why didn't you do it with me? <laughs> Somebody else reap what you planted. That's what John 4.38 says. We reap and we become co-laborers in this harvest. Folks, it doesn't matter who wins people to Jesus. It matters that they are part of the kingdom. That's what matters. And everywhere you go, God's got people in your path every one of us, every one of us, where we plant seeds and plant seeds and plant seeds. And sometimes, you know, the Bible says, don't grow weary in doing well. Sometimes we, I've planted seeds and I've planted seeds and I've planted seeds, I've seen no growth. You don't know what's happening in that person's heart. God is doing the impossible. And so we just keep planting. And then when the time is right, we reap a harvest, and we might reap that soul that somebody else planted the seed. And what a joy that is. But it takes a little bit of effort, doesn't it? It takes us to go and speak to people. It takes, you know, it takes something. We just do what's possible. Every one of us has a mouth. Every one of us has a brain. Every one of us has a voice. And so we just go and speak the word of God. And God causes it to grow. He's the one that's doing the impossible. As fellow workers with Christ, all you have to do is the possible. I know that we've heard messages that we need to go and do the impossible. Guess what? As I've been studying, the Lord's I used to preach that. The Lord's been changing my mind, saying, Kevin, I never called you to the impossible. Only God can do the impossible. I've only called you to do what's possible. Oh, isn't that a little bit of free that I don't have that weight on me to do the impossible? I just do what's possible. Do you know what I'm doing? I just do what's possible. And God does the impossible. 
everywhere you go, you just speak, you lay hands on people, you do what's possible. God does the impossible. And as Paul says, you become a fellow worker with him. Isn't it good that you're a fellow worker with God and that you're not doing everything?